So Sorur um, will tell us about parallel processing, uh, pro programming in R. And um, please join me in welcoming Sorur to this to the podium. Oh, oh sorry, I, actually I forgot. I wanted to give a little bit of intro about Sorur. So Sorur, apart from being a very dear friend of us, she's, uh, she, she's now doing her, her, her master. And so she's really busy, but she still found the time to come here and tell us all, I mean, everything that she knows uh, about, um, about this topic. So please join me in um, welcoming to her. Thank you, Anna. It's always a pleasure to be here um, with, uh, among the Our Ladies community and help particularly women, not limited to women, but particularly women to advance their um, programming skills. So today I'm not, unless, uh, so if you, if you have been to the previous event, uh, we usually start from, thank you, we usually have slides, but uh, today if I manage to get this, I probably can't zoom in. Um, is, that, is that clear to everyone or is it too small? So let's open that in browser. Yep. That's good. So yes, um, make it short. No slides. We are going to work from a markdown document today, just because it enables us to see the code and the solution. So the result, the output of the command in the components. Uh, and generally nice. So this markdown slide is available on GitHub repository. Thanks to Anna, she has done a lot of great work on uh, essentially breaking down. Uh, so previously we used to have one single GitHub repository with all the resources in there, but uh, Anna did uh, this great work and uh, now made a uh, individual repository for each event. So you can easily go into the uh, parallel programming event repository and just clone the the connection instructions to connect. Uh, so, uh, we'll start with some basic and more intuitive uh, concepts, and then we'll get to more advanced uh, concepts in parallelization. Um, I am pretty sure that um, you have been, you have already been using parallelization. you want to see. So this is the link to the GitHub repository. So I'll just leave it there. Just a quick outline while everyone else is bringing up the link and then are downloading the R markdown slide. Uh, you're going to start with virtualization, which is like a, essentially an in your, yeah. Can I use the, the microphone? Oh, the microphone, sorry. Does that work? I'll try to stand here and not to go far, farther away from that. So we'll start with vectorization, and I'll show how you already have been using vectorization uh, in your day-to-day -day and basic routine analysis with R. We'll then go with apply family, which has, so how many people here have been using apply, different flavors of apply functions? So the majority of you, yeah, about 80%. Then we'll go to slightly more advanced and uh, faster uh, versions that we can do parallelization still on a single core. So I'll make sure that, and if I don't, please do remind me that there's a difference between running a job on a single core and running a job, distributing a job actually on multiple cores. So you know that your computers usually come with at least like four cores or four processing units or CPUs. So one of the ways to get the uh, jobs faster is just to make sure, so parallelization means this distribution of the jobs, of the tasks, um, on different cores. Um, and then, um, so reduce, map, do parallel, and mapply, these are the versions that they still give you an improved performance, but they still use single core compared to for loops, say. Versus, uh, then, yeah, at the end, and this is, well, to me, this is the most important section. 
uh, will introduce packages such as for each parallel and do parallel, which actually enables you to go beyond a single core utilization and distribute your job, dispatch your job um, on different cores, on multiple cores. When I say dispatch or distribute, does everyone know what I am talking about? What is my, what do I mean when I say dispatching or distributing a job on different cores? Is that one single job? What are the assumptions that I am making here? Anyone having any idea? So when I say distribute a job, I mean that take your for loop. So first, the aim of today is that to find an alternative to the for loop, i.e. we have a number of operations, it, uh, operations that has to be in each iteration, right? So take your for loop, take your iterations. Uh, we want to make sure that each iteration, iteration is done on a core when we talk about par parallelism. So this is what we mean by parallelization. We want to process everything in parallel. So if this is your for loop at the top, you want to make branches. Right, and every iteration goes into one of these branches. I think we have a whiteboard here. Can you show whiteboard? Yeah. This is, so assume this box is my for loop, and I have, say, 20 jobs, 20 rounds of iterations, right? My computer has four CPUs, one, two, three, four. That means that it enables me to run these 20 jobs to distribute them over these four cores. That's the parallelization. So this is the dispatch of what we call job or an iteration over four different ones. The assumptions that we are making here is that we are assuming that the operations that we do in each round of iteration is independent from the other iteration. So i.e. the output do not need to be communicated to each other. That's a different context. This is not what we are assuming here. Thank you. Um, all the material that we are covering today is assuming that all these iterations, the results are independent of each other. They do not cross to it. If, if you need to parallelize your job or your iterations or operations in a way that they need to be talking to each other, that's a different context. That's called MPI. And this is essentially, I'm not sure if it's done in R or it has to be done in high performance. Usually it's done on high performance computing systems. So this is what I mean by distribution of job and parallelization. Going beyond a single core and making sure that iterations are spread over different um, cores. So starting with vectorization, um, you have already been using vectorization. Um, so when you do, when you you define your x and y and you do you add them together, you are doing a vector operation. You're adding one vector to the other. Similarly, when you have this uh, logical expression, you get the result not for one single element of x, but rather for all elements of x. Similar when you do, uh, it's the same case with when you do subtraction or when you multiply, multiply or two vectors or when you divide them. So you have already been using, this is the, what it means. The operation is done over a vector as opposed to one single element of the vector. So this thing, vectorization, comes, uh, our, uh, so we say vectorization um, when it comes to the parallel, parallelization of on an R object. And so these are usually uh, inbuilt functions by R. Um, we learn how to mimic the behavior of these vectorization functions, i.e. plus, you know, multiply, subtract, Further later when we go through um, different parallelization uh, functions that we can use. Uh, but this is just to let you know that um, this is basically the context, uh, the idea, going beyond one element, operating on lists or vectors. 
So same in a case when you have matrices. So it's not only limited um, to vectors, it's the same when you have matrices. Um, all the stuff that you have been doing, including multiplication or element wise or whether the true matrix multiplication, that's already, it's a kind of vectorization. Uh, the majority of you have already been using um, these shorthand functions like call sums, which take the sum of these. So when it comes to matrix operations, basic arithmetic such as mean, median, standard deviations, you can write a for loop. A for loop in that case should go through every column or every row depending of what is your interest. If you're interested in finding the mean of every row in your matrix, you have to have a for loop for that, right? So this is my matrix, row one, two, three to n, and I am interested to take the mean of each row. So the mean of elements. If you didn't know anything about the vectorization and stuff, you would have written a for loop that says for i, mean of, for example, my data frame or my matrix at row i, right? This is how you do that. But R has uh, these uh, sort of shortcuts, these optimized, these are already optimized versions that are able to operate on rows or columns uh, and do the basic arithmetic that you're interested in. So call sums, if you're interested to take the sums of a matrix over a columns, Row sums, call means, row means. These are the ones that are available in R, but if you're interested to do more, slightly more advanced stuff like the standard deviation or median, uh, you can use the um, tools, the functions that are made available through matrix, the stat package, which is a crown package. Now, so far so good. Let's move to apply functions. Apply, so there are different families of these apply functions, we have L apply. Let's just start with L apply. The idea is to take a list of items, so a list object, and do an operation, execute a function over each element of the list. L apply with L apply, you can do this. And what it returns you back is that it returns a list with the same number of elements as your initial list, but now, each element of the newly produced list is essentially is the one that has, the function has been applied, the function of your interest has been applied to that. Is that so let's go to this example, for example. So let's say my x is a list of, the first element of the list is just a vector of, num, num, a numeric vector of one to five, and then I have some random normal numbers, uh, 10, I'm sorry, 10, drawing just 10 random numbers from a normal distribution. And um, I want to find the mean of each of the elements in the list. So I should, I will use L apply. Apply, L for list. Apply to the list a function. The syntax is that you give it first, the first argument is your list, the second argument is the function that you're interested in. And you see you are getting a list back. So, Say for example, if you're, so we say that the first element is your list, the second element is the function. After you have specified the first couple of elements, uh, arguments, you can insert all the arguments to that function, all the remaining arguments to that function as the third first uh, or as the remaining argument, uh, so i.e. You have your list first, then you have your function, and if your function requires any other arguments to be passed, because remember what L apply can does, it can take one, it takes one element of the list and a function. So you're assuming that your functions is taking only a single argument. What it does, for example, it says that for number one, so my x is a vector of one to four, what it essentially does is that it takes one and then 
it takes the R uniform subject. So R unif is just to make random samples from a uniform distribution. But you have to specify what kind of characteristic that uniform distribution should have. Uh, and you specify this true mean, providing the mean and the max argument. So I'm saying that your function R unif The first argument of that function is the number of points that you want to generate from that uniform distribution, followed by, you know, what's the max, what's the mean. These are the second arguments of the function. You can specify the second and third arguments by drinking them after the function. All good? So here I'm taking, um, I'm generating one point from a normal distribution from, sorry, a uniform distribution over zero and 10. In the second round of iteration of L apply, we are generating two points, randomly taking two points, three points, and four points, so on and so forth. So say you have your own functions. You don't want to, you, you want to use your own customized function. Remember your L apply syntax, takes your list, and the second argument is your function. And then all the other arguments that have to go through the function, except from the main argument to the function. So that function, you can, define, you can use one of the existing functions, such as rUnif that we use, or you can write your own. Um, and that's essentially done through providing exactly identical, so the same way, in a general way that you write your function, you have your function, brackets, arguments, and then some operation within the body of the function. So you can just provide the name of the function that you have written, or you can, for example, define that area before your L apply, and then you can say L apply list my function, and if your function is taking more than one argument, you can add in any other additional argument at the end. You can just append it to the end. So for example, let's say x is a list uh, of two matrices. And I have this function here, which what it does is that it takes the first column of the matrix. If I want to apply this function over each element of the list x, I can just do l apply x fun is equal to function, the name of the function that you have generated. And remember what you get. So what l apply does, it takes each, it takes the first element of your list, which is a matrix, it extracts the first column, one, two, and it returns it. But eventually at the end, all the outputs from all different iterations or four different operations that l apply applies on the element in the list, they are sort of appended to each other, they are combined to each other um, as a list. So you get a list back. Starting with a list and ending with a list. And the number of elements stays the same as your starting list. Uh, one thing that I would like to emphasize here is that if you are using a base R function or you are defining your own your own function that has more than one argument. Remember, if I have, for example, this um, MF function that's defined as function x, y, z, for example, and I do something within the within the body of the function, can someone tell me that if I apply a list, which of these arguments is taken first? So which of these arguments are the ones that uh, L apply assumes that it has to substitute the element of the list with that argument? Sorry? Always the first one. So 
uh, I'm defining my function. My function has three arguments. Laplace operates over each single element of the list. Right? So it always takes the first element of the list and it applies the function over it. But if you have if you, if you have one function, that's fine. There's no confusion argument. If you have more than three arguments, LApply and other apply family functions, and generally all the other functions that we are introducing in this session, always assume that the first argument is the element in the list. Is that clear? So the second element of the list in the second operation becomes x again, and the operation is done. So what do I do if I need to provide y and z? Just goes in here. And I do my L apply. Function mf, I call it mf. And I say argument y, for example, is x2, another vector, or another set of parameter, or it could be a constant even. And z is another constant, another vector, right? So these functions always assume, all the apply family functions always assume, you have to treat them as a function with a single argument. If you have more than one argument in your function and you would like to specify them, they come after uh, specifying the function name. So everything else, apart from the first argument, goes at the end. Yeah, that's not. Any questions? <laughs> yes, a data frame is by nature a list, right? So you can apply, if you do L apply your data frame, each column of your data frame becomes an element that's passed to L apply. So each iteration of L apply works, operates on column of your data frame. S apply is very similar to L apply, but instead of requiring lists as an input, it takes um, vectors as input. So it operates on vectors, but it also returns a list. So everything is the same. Um, sorry, the output is a vector again. So it takes a, uh, the input is a vector and the output is a vector again. So for example, let's go back to our familiar question. If X is a list of um, A, B, C, D, um, and you apply, you want to apply mean of them, if you use L apply on that list, uh, you will get a list back. S stands for a simplified version of apply. Right, so instead of getting the list, a list back, you'll get a vector out. Everything that stays the same, the output type is different. But instead of just relying on L apply or apply, um, because you know, there are, so L apply requires the input to be a list. S apply, it can be a list, it could be a vector. But if you want more flexibility, i.e. if you want to apply one function for example, particularly to some margins in a matrix. So to all the rows or all the columns in a matrix, you would use the apply function by itself. So what is the syntax? I would like to start with examples. If I have an X, which is a matrix generated from some random numbers, like from a normal distribution with some mean and some mean of 20 and a standard deviation of 10, I want to take the mean of each column of that function. With the apply function, you have to provide it the index of the margin that you are interested in, over which you want to apply your, um, execute your function. One stands for rows, and two stands for the column. So when I say apply x to mean, means that apply to each element of x, which is a list, sorry, a matrix, apply to the number two. Number two, the second dimension is a column in a matrix, apply to all the columns in matrix x, mean, function mean. 
Note that instead of mean, you can put in your own function. You can define the function right in the um, apply section. Or you can um, or you can define your function, the function that you're interested in like, earlier, and then provide the name of the function. So let's see. Let's see, for example, how can I define uh, a function in place when I am using so within apply. So for example, x is a matrix. And I want to apply to rows of x. So x index is 1. I want the first dimension. And I want to apply a function that's my own function, but I have to I want to specify that like in place. So I'll say fun is equal to function and then define my function. Uh, if you are if you are using in place function definition, make sure that you start fun is equal. You have to let them know that this argument that you are using as the input is a is a function. You want it to be treated to to be assigned to the function argument. So note that apply does essentially what we just covered uh, about the ones that we say that the performance. They use vectorization and their performance is optimized. So apply x1 sum is identical to using row sum. But who can tell me? Do you have any idea which one would be faster if I use apply or if I use row sum? Row sum. These functions are written in I in a way that they are most optimized. So for basic arithmetic, if, you, if there is something that has been already developed in R, it always performs faster. Everything that works on vectorization, everything that's in, that involves parallelizing an R object, this is way faster than everything that you have to you know, manipulate it to get the same output. So row sum, row mean, call sum, and call means, they're always faster than using apply. With the margins, with the you know doing operation on the row on the dimension one or doing operation on dimension two. Any questions? I guess we are we are processing we are proceeding very fast. So, but which is good because I want to get to the last point, which is about the um, using the packages. This is where the concept of parallelization um, comes into play. So, any questions so far? So how many of you have already been using or have had some familiarities with reduce, map, do call, or mapply, or any of these single functions? That means that at least something new for me to make sure that we are covering very well. OK. So uh, up until now, the apply family, what they have been doing is that they have been taking one element of the list. So they have been going one by one, right? But, but in a way that it's way more optimized than using a for loop. Now, what we are interested in is um, we want to, we have different scenarios. We want to take more than one element. We want to see how that works. So let's just start with reduce. What reduce does is essentially, so if you, for example, you have, so x is the list of, a, and so imagine we define A as something like B and C. Uh, what it does is that it takes it takes two elements at the time. So we are doing reduce. And it's starting with capital R. So yes, these functions are with they start they start with capital R. Map starts with capital N or uppercase N. So what reduce does it takes it takes the first two elements, it works on two things at the at once. So first you specify your function. Unlike apply, when function or L apply, when function is the second or the third argument, for reduce and map, 
the function that is your first argument. And then what it does is applies that function over the first two elements. It takes the results. So let's call it res1. Okay. Then it applies the function on res1 and the third element c in the list. And so on and so forth. So each time you're doing operation on two elements of your list, not on one single element. And the result of the previous iteration is combined or is taken into account, is, is sort of uh, transferred between iterations. So you take the result of the first iteration and that becomes one of the elements plus the other element, the next element in the list, the operation is done on so it's a, you're operating on pairs of element at once and the result as uh, the result of the operation and at the end of each iteration is passed to the second iteration. So let's hope that this example, for example, makes it more clear. I have a list, it has three elements. Each element is a vector, is a character vector. If I apply reduce, uh, I'm using the intersect function. I am interested in to take the intersection of all the three elements in the list. Right? I want to see what that returns to me. Um, who, is, who wants to sort of tell me what's the, what are the steps involved? What does reduce does? That's it, that's exactly it, thank you. So this is what's happening. You're doing operations on pairs of element at one time, and yes, you're all impressive women. Um, so let's do instead what um, map does. So map, map still operates on two. Uh, Yes, yes. So it could be depending on what element in the list. So for example, say that um, you have each element in your list is a numeric vector. So you can still use me. A common example is that, that people use C bind or R bind because they are interested in combining elements in a list in a way that they want. So for example, um, if I have a list of elements and I want to R bind them. So to R bind, you can have reduce, R bind, list. And what R bind does is that it merges all the rows, appends all the rows to each other. The result of that iteration is taken forward to the next iteration. And then you do uh, R bind to the object that was created in the first operation and the third element in the list. So it could be any function. It could be your own function. Uh, it could be anything from, it could be a base function, a base R function. All good. So this is moving beyond operations, which is one element by element. This is operating on two elements at a time with this, um, with this characteristic that what we are doing, we are, um, passing over the result of alteration in the, the result in the first iteration to the second iteration. So, map, capital M. Again, the first argument is your function, a base function or your own function. But instead of having an X, which is the list, it has two arguments. Well, it has definitely more than two. But the, the idea today is to learn how to improve and speed up the operations. So what map does is that it takes one element of x, so, assume, so say this is one to three, and this is four to seven, four, six, five, four, six, seven, yes, four, five, six. 
Okay. So it takes it takes um, the first element of x and the first element of y and applies f to them and returns it. Returns a list. Doesn't do anything to them. Doesn't merge them. It doesn't combine them. It's not operating on the previous iteration. It's just taking just taking one element of each, but operating on elements. And this is what we mean in parallel. So take x, take y. Perhaps it's better to show it like this. This is your x, this is your y, this is one, two, three, uh, four, five, six. It performs f over that one and four. Then the next iteration it performs f to two and five, and then to three and six, and returns them as a list. And this is what we see here. So if you apply the paste, which concatenates the or its argument together, if you do paste, you do, uh, for example, let's say I have a vector here. So my x here is a character vector of arc, option, no. Uh, for some reason, I just like to put no. And one, two, three. And they are separated, um, and they are separated by the underline. So the result is a list where the first element of x is concatenated to the first element of y using a dash. So arg1, option2, not 2 So one potential usage of this, for example, could be that when you are doing simulations, you are generally, if, if you are doing simulations that work on like two sets of parameters and you're interested in all different combinations of those two sets of parameters, this is how you can do operations on those. So this could be, for example, uh, your um, sum function, it adds up the elements. So what it does, it takes one and four and adds them up. So in that case, you have map, sum, x and y, which is essentially the same, same thing. Uh, so it's uh, two elements at the same time. So it's going down. It's not transferring anything. It's going down and then applying each operation to it. The other uh, functions that I find handy is uh, do.call. Uh, this is very useful, particularly in cases when you have a functions, for example, with 20 sets of arguments, with 20 arguments, right? And you want to pass these arguments in a list. So the functions is designed in a way that it takes a list of arguments and then it breaks it down, whatever it does, is that the input, it's important, the input is a list. Uh, so do do dot call takes a function. So say for example, if I am I have a list of equal elements, and um, I want to turn it into a data frame. Any suggestions how I can do this with do dot call? A list and that list of this is a list of um, the elements are, all have the same number of elements in the list. What function should go here in order to make a list to a data frame? So I just want to, yeah. Any ideas? We have plenty of time. I can write right to the morning. Yeah. element two, element three, and I have A, B, C, one, two, three, four, five. I want to turn this into a data frame using do.call. See mine, thank you. Or it could be Arbine, right? It just depends how you want to, yeah. Yeah, I've never, or I rarely do this. Like, I yeah. 
Yeah. Kind of. So reduce just works on two elements at the time and just carries the result of the first rotation to the second. But this one works on everything at once. So that's why I'm saying that for, if you have a function that takes a list of arguments and then within that function something happens to that list of arguments, the most proper way of passing that whole list, complete list to the function, is using do dot um, call. They, yeah, they were very similar, right? Yeah. Yes, it, with C bind and R bind, yes, but for other functions, for example, they may not. As I said, so if, for example, that f is your own customized function, that the input to the function is a list, and that list could be, you know, could be, for example, what's the value for parameter x and parameter y and parameter z, right? So, so depending on the function, reduced and do dot call can have same characteristic. They can have same output. They could be doing the same thing or they could be doing different things. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, but we can't tell which one is faster, right? Okay. If you if you want to really, um, so we are, what we are saying, I guess my argument is that as far as I know, they all well equally well. Okay. So, but which one to use? Um, it just depends on the situation. So, if you need to apply something iteratively over uh, the list of your functions, over pairs, pairs, pair element of, yeah, you want to use reduce. But if you need to apply that operation simultaneously on elements of a vector, then you do not. So I would say, in terms of speed and efficiency, they are probably roughly all the same. Um, they are very fast, which is what we need. One of the aims of parallelization is to get them done as fast as possible. Um, but which one is the best, it really depends to the question that you're dealing with and what you want to do. So I mentioned uh, map, for example, as a way to generate um, arguments for a simulation. But in a simulation, in a real case simulation, you typically you are typically dealing with, say, four or five parameters. So alpha, beta, rho, alpha one, alpha two. <laughs> and so on and so forth. And uh, you're often interested in all different combinations of this parameter and you want to pass them. And this is probably what do.call comes into effect, comes into place because you can, you can generate a list of arguments. Each element of the list becomes a parameter set, right? And then you want to pass this to the function. Um, this is what grid, expanded grid does. So if you're interested to find um, different combinations, all possible different combinations of parameters, you can use expanded grid to essentially generate a data frame um, of um, different, um, all, all different combinations. So for example, say if my n is defined as that and k is four and two, and row is zero and 0 0.5, and I want to do a simulation, alpha is generated as, as that way, If and I want to do a simulation which parameters are all different combinations of uh, n, k, rho, and alpha, uh, I can use expanded grid, and this is what it returns. I'm just renaming the call names in the second line, but essentially this is what you expect to see. It's the data frame, and for every element in your n, you get all different combinations that, for example, n 24, uh, k 4, rho 0, alpha 0, or you can have n as 40, k, uh, k 4, rho is 0, alpha 0, and so on and so forth. So expanded grid is an efficient way of coming with all different combinations of a group of things that you are interested in. Um, and 
So say, for example, if this is the main function that's doing my stimulation, i.e. takes n k rho on alpha n, so a simulation, you need to usually repeat it you know, for a reasonable number of time. Uh, so say my repeat number is 1,000. I'm just saying that, for example, the simulation for the parameter set where n is blah, 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 um, do something. So this is my body, my, my simulator, the, uh, my body function that runs my simulator. But what's the proper way to apply? So I have defined a function that takes known arguments. I want to apply that function and I, have, and I have generated a data frame or all different possible combinations of the parameters and I just want to apply that function to every single poss possible combination of the parameters. <laughs> you know, confuse myself. But you are taking one function and you are applying that to all different combinations of the parameters that you have generated. Good? You would use mapply to do that. So mapply takes one function here is my simulator, uh, run simulator, and then um, it takes it takes its argument to that function from all the subsequent arguments to mapply. So the f um, it's, it's kind of similar to map. Then you take one argument from x, the other argument from y, but with mapply is an extension of map because you are not limited to using x and y. So two, you can have more than two. So this is very well suited for uh, simulation studies when you have generally more than two parameters and uh, you want to apply a function over those. And here my param, recall that my param is just the data frame that is generated from all different possible combinations. I have a feeling that mapply should work on run simulator on PAMS, so that's essentially what it does. Um, I think the documentation says that arguments, the second arg uh, arguments to and onwards can be either vectors or it can be lists. And note that the params that you have generated is just a data frame, which is a list, essentially. List. And the most interesting part, any questions before we head to Essentially, the last section. Good. So we are prepared for ourselves to. So note, up, on, up until now, we have been optimizing. We have been speeding up the the performance of our functions on a single core. We are still having. We are still on one single CPU, and we are not using all the capability. Our laptops usually come with a minimum of four, as far as I know. But it could be, I don't know, I'm not a computer science person. It could be less, it could be more. Um, but say, for example, if I have four, I want to make sure that I'm using all four processors, all four CPUs at the same time. Perhaps just because my iterations are just too large that neither of apply family or reduce or map or do.call or mapply, they are not appropriate for the purpose of my situation, for the purpose of the, my, my, for my intention the thing that I want to do. So now we are going back to the, the scenario that we had earlier, the one that the first sketch that I made. A single box which defines my iteration, just in instructing that I have this number of operations, iterations that needs to be done, and I'm distributing them over different CPUs or different branches. So. We ended up the last section with mapply, uh, which works, still does a parallelization, but on single core. But if you want to go beyond single core, if I want to use more than one core, then we can use MCL apply, which is the parallelized version of L apply. So it completely behaves as L apply, but instead of working on one core, it's now using the number of cores that you are telling me to use. So it's a, it's a part of the parallel package, so you need to have library, parallel, parallel, and then you can use, uh, you can apply your function. So again, similar to lapply, when we take a list, so MCL apply enables you to start with a vector, not only a list, but the same argument is true about the list. 
So you can have your list or you can have vector and then your function. So here, for example, the function is just tells the computer to go to a slip for 10 seconds. This is, for example, a simple version of the function. But I'm saying that this needs to be done over 10 calls. So what it does is that it does the, what they call like the resource allocation, the, the split, it, it splits the jobs over 10 cores or whatever number of cores that you have specified. If you need to know um, how many cores your computer have and what's your limits that you can use. And also note that when we say parallelization, uh, yes, it is about using the CPU using your computers, but it also, it's also about how much memory each process each iteration, the process that is involved in, so in each iteration you have a set of functions that do something on your data. We all know very well that R has some limitations in terms of memory and RAM, so it just depends on the RAM that's available on your computer. So you have to make sure that in each of the iterations that's done, um, you have yeah. you have enough memory to be able to, you know, embed or in, um, embed all these different operations. So, so yes, you can make it fast by, by splitting the job over different nodes, but if you don't have enough memory, if you're reading in, for example, a huge data frame in each iteration, that's problematic. Um, because essentially what you are doing is that you are reading in that data frame, that huge data frame, uh, so say for example, if you have 10 jobs and you're using 10 cores, you're reading in on the same computer, on the same RAM space, you're reading in the data frame 10 times. That's technically what you're doing. And if you don't have enough memory, you can come across the issues. So yes, it does give you some improvements in terms of speed, but you have to make sure that you have to make sure that you are considering two aspects. There has to be a balance between using CPUs and the memory allocation. Um, so that's that's a minimal version of parallelization. Library, parallel, and then using MCL apply, which is completely identical to apply. Uh, and, um, but it's a, it's a parallel version of that. But, so the reason actually, and one of the, the only motivation to, I mean, um, I didn't, I wasn't using any of these stuff on le until uh, the, I, I really had to because in um, we, the majority of us at our ladies, we are working with dealing with biological data. I'm sure that in your organization, you're, you're dealing with large data sets. Um, these data sets that you're receiving, we are receiving are getting larger and larger and larger. So at some stage, I was sort of overwhelmed by the fact that A, there are plenty of them, but B, I realized that it's one thing, it's one uh, operation, it's one process that I have to apply preferably simultaneously on all these different data sets. And that was only the only time that I started to use the for each package. Or to actually, like looking for ways to uh, go beyond this manual you know, I didn't want to, that was too boring for me to, you know, do read that table, for example, for essentially 10 different, what we call pick callers or, <laughs> so well, it's, uh, imagine you have like, I don't know, 50, but it's, uh, it's less for me, but, uh, so imagine, for example, you have, uh, I have had a case when I had, say, um, 10, and I had to do comparison, like compare five to the five, and, so it was a pairwise comparison between files. So what I wanted to be able to do was that I wanted to be able to A, read file A and its corresponding file, so the one that I need to compare with B at the same time and do some operation. But I wanted this operation to be also simultaneously done on all on the remaining four pairs. And this is where 4H really helped me and was essentially motivation for giving this workshop. Um, so this is what I mean by the mighty. I really, I really, in my report, uh, which my boss and everyone else saw that, I really started with the fact that the mighty for each because I was overwhelmed with the 
um, the, the amount of data that I needed to deal with, it wasn't for me, it, for me it was too much. And, but when, when I found this solution, I was so excited and I said the mighty bridge steps in and it reduces all the problems down to essentially four or five single lines of code. So what does this mighty bridge does? Um, it takes, the first argument to this uh, is an iterator. So similar to your for loop when you say one, uh, A is, you know, for one to, I don't know, N, or it could be an iterator of a specific type. They have, a, they have their own specific iterators in for each. Uh, I definitely suggest you go to, uh, you have a look at the uh, documentation for for each and see what are different possible ways that you can do iteration. Is that iteration over a list? Is that using one to n? Is that like the specific objects such as iterators? But what for each does is that, um, so there are two ways that you can use for each. You can use for each and still be operating on a single core. But you can also use for each and dispatch or split your jobs over different cores. If you are, um, if you are, uh, if you want to, if you want to, uh, do all your jobs in one single core, you would use do. So for something, and I will talk about the additional arguments here, for something, do, ex, ex stands for execution, execute my commands, the things that I am instructing you. But if I want you to split that, if you want to split the jobs, i.e. each iteration over node, or so if you have, what happens if you have four cores and 10 jobs? What happens is that the packages, um, so for each and parallel, they, they themselves come up with a way to split the jobs in a way that it's appropriate. Um, so anyway, if you want to, if you don't want to use parallelization and still you want to use for each, um, you would use do. But if you, if you want to parallelize uh, your for each core, your for each loop over different cores, you would use do par, and that just, so for using that do par operation, you need to have do parallel package, uh, do parallel package loaded first, and you need to have some cluster setups, which I will talk about uh, soon. So that's the, that's, the, that's the first difference. Do when you're using single core, do parallel when you're using for each, and you want to split your jobs over single or over different um, cores. Can anyone tell me? Uh, okay, no. So first, let's talk about the. So we talked about the first argument. We say that that's your that's your iterator. The second um, and third argument. So this has um, so for each. If you look up the, the um, documentation for for each, it has a few arguments, but. Um, I would like to specifically point at these um, combined final packages and export document. So when I said I had five pairs of data set and I was interested to compare them to do some operations simultaneously on one on on pairs at each time, uh, I mean in one go. Uh, I have to come up with a way to combine. It's generally the case that. You want to combine all these results from different data sets um, into a uniform or a unified object, R object, i.e. a data frame. So I read in my data, my, uh, the pair of data, I do my comparison, but, and then I have the result. I have the result from the first iteration, I have the result from the second iteration and the third iteration. And remember, none of these functions enable you to cross store. You know, the, all the jobs are, all the iterations are all independent to each other. What do I want to do with these outputs? Output from iteration one to n, for example. So I've, it's possible that A, be aware that you always get a list at the end of each iteration. So whatever the result is, for each tries to, by default, tries to reshape it or generate it as a list, right? So then you should tell it, if you are interested in, so you have a list as a first iteration, a list for the second iteration, a list for the third iteration, and so on and so forth. How do you combine them? If I want to have a data frame, I would use CBind. 
because I get a list at end of the operation and I want to combine them using CBind, that gives me a data frame at the end. Or I can use RBind, or I can use the simple C for concatenation, right? So uh, dot combine is an argument that you can, is where you can uh, specify that how you would like to aggregate the results from each iteration together. So for each iterates, do different alteration. Each iterator, at each, it, at each iteration, it does its own processing. You get the results of each iteration, and then you need to come up with a way to aggregate them. And this is done through combine. In some situations, you also want to do something at the very end. So before returning the data frame, you might, be able, you might want to, for example, transform a column. You want to, for example, log two transform or log 10 transform a column, right? So this is an operation that needs to be done right at the very end. So this is a specified to dot, dot final. Dot final takes a function, a single argument function. So it assumes that, uh, so whatever you have, it assumes that from the result of all iteration, once the combine, the, com is, the function specified in combine is applied to them, is a single thing, it's a single object. Dot final is actually, a, so you say that dot final is equal to a function to the x, but it only takes one argument and then you do something to the x. It could be transforming one of the columns of x. It could be renaming the one of the columns of x, right? Um, so that's what dot final does. Dot package and dot export more uh, become um, really, they, they play the role when you are parallelizing um, your for each, the operations that you are doing your for each, your iterations. <laughs> Because what do they do is that dot packages you tell for each that the body, the, the code in the body of uh, my for each um, syntax or command uh, is relying on functions or variables from package x, y, and z. This is where you would specify them. Why? The idea is that This is your machine, your computer. Here you are starting your for each uh, job, and this is like your different cores. The idea is that um, if, if if the process that has to be done over this iteration has some is using a function from a package. That function, if you have used library to load the package, that package name and all the functions that are available to you by using that library only exist on that single instance. So once you start to, on, 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 on the current CPU that you're using, once you, once you try to split your job over different CPUs, you no longer have access to the stuff that you have in your current environment. You have to make sure that the functions or the variables are made available to each single, what they call, fork or worker. These workers, these different workers are your CPUs, are the things that you are running your job over, but they don't have any information about the parameters or parameters that the variables that you have specified here or the stuff that you have loaded from the a library here. So you need to make them available. It's about a, it's about the, in, the function environment. It's about the evaluation environment. When you do library, all the um, functions in that specific library are accessible only through your global environment, which is your home directory. But where the function is actually executed is on different CPUs from where you are working at the moment, and it has no information about the variables in that library. We know that, I guess, so, and this is probably we should have had an advanced R session earlier, but the idea is that the function, each time that you run a function, the function creates an, 
evaluation environment and sorry, an execution environment. And unless the variables or the functions that you're using in the body of your function are explicitly defined and transported to, exported to that evaluation environment, you cannot, uh, your code cannot be successfully completed. Global environment. How is the layer? How many? How many of you do about environments in R? Okay. So what happens is that your working directory is a global environment. Whenever you add a library, another layer is added to that environment. Okay. And what happens is that when you ask, for example, for a standard deviation, for functional standard deviation, it looks at the global environment, i.e. in your current working directory. If it can't find a standard deviation, a definition for a standard deviation, it will take that and do the, that operation on that. If it doesn't find that on your global environment, it goes to the second layer, which is the library that you have loaded, right? It looks in the environment that generated by the, as a result of loading that library to look for the definition of a standard deviation. So this is the idea. Whenever you are, um, and, uh, and whenever you are running a function, that function creates an, an execution environment by itself, by itself. Um, so that's the idea. When you split jobs over different CPUs, you have different execution environments. So you have to be sure that the functions, so the standard deviation is defined over each of these forkers or each of these workers. How do we ensure that this is done? This is through using dot packages. So dot packages essentially takes a vector, a character vector of the package names. And it makes sure that all the elements from the packages that you have specified in your dot packages are made available to each of these workers. I.e., you have all these functions and variables um, available to um, the processes that you want to do over each CPU or for each worker. Any questions? Yeah? So that's in the case if you're you're using some function that exists in a package. What if you have defined a function in here in your global environment, which is your working directory? Is that do you recommend if you split your job over different CPUs? Do you reckon the function that you have defined in your working, your global environment, i.e. the directory that you're working on, does it get passed to all the CPUs? Is it made accessible to those or what do you think? No? No, so this is not the package. This is you defining. So who else? So what? What everyone else? I, I need to. I need some more work. No, <laughs> it doesn't matter. We're all learning. So who votes for no? So by no, I mean that um, if I have if I have a definition for a function in my global environment, it's not passed to the other CPUs. So how many vote for no? How many vote for yes? Well, yes, you have to put it in expert, right? Otherwise, it's not. So no is correct. <laughs> no. So yes, 
you have to put it in an export. You have to make sure that the argument, the, the variable is made available to the worker, regardless of, you know, as, as soon as you start a function, you run a function, you are in a different environment. It doesn't matter on CPU X, CPU Y, CPU Z. Each function that's run, has been run, um, it has its own environment. And you need to make sure that if you're using package functions from packages, you need to make sure that the environment that has been uh, generated is aware of the package. If you're using something that has been defined in your global directory, you have to make sure that it has been exported to that um, in execution environment. So this is the logic behind um, using packages and export. And as I said, there are only they only come into uh, play, or they, they are only like proper to use only in, in, if you're parallelizing. Yep. The idea is that it has to be available to every single CPU. And the only way to make sure that this is done is to find that the package. Or is more for like situations where you have something in your environment. The idea of export and export. So if you're generating something, then you would report it. But you know, if you're using something from outside, it can't. Um, so that means that from the current environment that I am running the initial, the whole loop, the, the mother, the origin loop, uh, do export, export those variables as such. Um, in order to use for each, um, uh, with a parallelized version of for each, you need to make sure that you have, so unlike MCL apply, there is no argument in for each that you can, um, you know, let them aware of the number of CPUs. You remember in MCL apply, we had a function that would, we would specifically say that, you know, use this number of arguments. But with for each, if you want to parallelize using for each, you need to set up what they call a cluster. So they need to, you need to instruct R that, you know, make a, a cluster of this number of CPUs and then run this, run for each. And then for each nodes, how many CPUs it needs to deal with uh, based on the information that's provided to it using um, this setup. Yeah. How do you know how the store is possible? Yep, I'm covering that now. Okay. Yeah. So in order to know how many cores you have in your computer, A, you need to load the parallel package and then detect cores. So this detect cores will let you uh, know that you know, how many cores are there in your computer. So I'm saying that whatever cores are on my computer, just assign them to n core. So I need to do something, if, if I want to parallelize for each, I need to give it some instructions about how many CPUs to work on, what to do with them, and so on and so forth. So I need to make a cluster. And this is, uh, again, it's a, so something that's made available through the parallel package. So you make a cluster with um, any number of clusters that you want. This could be the total number of CPUs that you have, or you know, just for example, three by default, or you know, whatever number that you are interested in. You would then register uh, register that um, um, cluster. You would say that it's essentially informing R that I am going to run an, a function. That function needs to parallelize something. Um, it's about giving that the recognition. Um, so register your core and uh, your cluster, and this now becomes the function, define the function that you want to apply. So here I'm just doing, um, defining the 
um, some of the stuff that I need, but I guess this is the main. So once I've clustered, or once I set up my cluster, I use for each, I use my iterator, I tell it how to aggregate the results from each operation, I tell it what stuff to export, and then because I am parallelizing, because I have initiated a cluster with a certain amount of CPU, I need to use do path. Otherwise, for each did not parallelize stuff, you need to use do path. And then the uh, rest of the instruction body goes into the between the curly braces and then stop cluster once you're done. So once your for each is done, um, you have to make sure that you close the cluster to make the resources available. In a way, the, in a way, making cluster and registering it, you know, it's uh, it's instructing your computer that I have put aside this amount of CPU and memory, right, for this task. Uh, it's about reserving the resources on your computer. But once you are done with them, you have to free them up, right? And this is done through closing that connection or closing that cluster. That's it from me. Any questions? Maybe. Yeah? So you don't want to aggregate them. You don't want to aggregate them. Because when you say 10 jobs, to me it sounds that I can use um, I can use for each, right? I can do whatever I want to. I can have a, essentially a for loop, a parallelized for loop of 10 jobs, but then what do you want to do? If you want to write them into one identical output, then essentially you have to combine them. Okay. Yeah, so that's been done to the simple diagnostic stuff, for example, print or cat or C. Yeah, okay. Of, so what you said, if you need to, for example, have log files for each different cluster, you have to name the files differently, right? So again, 10 jobs as 10 logs, they are not all written to the same, or they can, or you can direct them to the same file, but I guess there is no value because, you know, one of them gets on top, you know, they, they get appended to the other. But if you want to generate log files, the, the best idea would be that if you have no intention to combine them, so this is like, if you like, Ancillary, so they are just side products of the function. They are not your main result, so as you said, it's just for you to track what went wrong, what went, what, what, what was the fault. So then you would generate, you would, for example, I don't know, use sync or use a cat or whatever you do to uh, directly output to, so you would name the files differently. In that case, you would get both. So once this iteration is done, if you have, you should have definitely a function that says that, you know, Yes, the starting document, add this stuff and close the document, right? So once they close the document within this iteration, you get logs for each of the iterations. Yeah, surely is. Uh, so as I said, you can one of the ways is to keep those connections open, right? But imagine because all the 10 jobs are running simultaneously, all the logs are just, you know, there's no order in them. You don't know which log is coming from which process, right? Yeah, and that's done, that's done by essentially naming, naming files, right? So process one is called, for example, I don't know, uh, process one dot log, right? And then oh, 
I'm gonna tell you, I think there has to be a way. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that if you work with it safely, there should be a way. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about that, but you guys can tell me. But I'm pretty sure there's some kind of, well, everything's really safe. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, see you in the next event.